The Dance Edit podcast is brought to you by Jackrabbit Dance. Jackrabbit is the industry's most reliable dance studio management software. If you're a studio owner, you know how important class management software is. Jackrabbit is going to make your life so much easier. Their software is cloud-based, powerful, and adaptable. And Jackrabbit has the industry's largest team of trainers, product coaches, and client success specialists to support you in your studio. You wouldn't accept less than the best from your students. Don't accept it from your software either. Visit jackrabbitdance.com and use the promo code DANCEMEDIA, all one word, for a free trial. Hi, dance friends, and welcome to the Dance Edit Podcast. I'm Margaret Fuhrer. I'm Courtney Escoyne. And I'm Cadence Neenan. We are editors at Dance Media, and in today's episode, we'll be talking about Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion's WAP video, which the internet has lost its collective mind over, and specifically about the dancing in that video. Getting into the problem of digital blackface on TikTok, where white users are appropriating black dances and rhythms. Discussing the fascinating and thorny history of The Point Shoe, a conversation prompted by A Point Magazine story, and hearing from Teresa Ruth Howard, the dancer and writer and founder of Memoirs of Blacks and Ballet. But before we get into all that, here is your reminder to make sure you're signed up for our daily Dance Edit newsletter, which is a one-minute read of a dance digest. You can subscribe at thedanceedit.com in case we're not already coming to your inbox. And also don't forget to follow us on Twitter at dance underscore edit and Instagram at the.dance.edit for even more timely updates and conversation. So now it's time for our weekly headline rundown. Um, There are a couple of important virus-related dance stories in here, but for the first time in what seems like a really long time, the list isn't completely dominated by pandemic news. Courtney, will you start us off? Sure. Uh, So the National Ballet of Canada announced further changes to its 2020-21 season, canceling all performances through the end of 2020, including, of course, The Nutcracker. The current plan is for the company to be back on stage in March. Um, According to reports by the Russian broadcast network RBC, COVID-19 has struck the Bolshoi and Marinsky theaters. Reportedly, a large number of artists with the Marinsky Theater have fallen sick and they've had to postpone all rehearsals of their production of Giselle. And at the Bolshoi, one dancer has fallen ill and all artists who came in contact with that dancer have been quarantined since. Uh, Sending positive thoughts their way. Uh... Closer to home, Third Rail Productions announced that immersive dance theater mainstay Then She Fell will permanently close after 4,444 performances over the course of seven and a half years. Not gonna lie, guys, this one hurt. That's, I mean, of course, also I say, it's not all dominated by pandemic news, and then we start out with three just terrible pandemic-related stories. Anyway, now heading in a more positive direction. In non-pandemic-related news, the University of Southern Mississippi's Precision Dance Team, along with the school's marching band, will be renamed. The dance team, known for the last 66 years as the Dixie Darlings, will determine a new name that better reflects its core values with the help of current and former members of the team. Uh, Black Dance Stories continues its conversation series on Thursday evenings this month. You can catch Sydney Mosley and Raja Feather Kelly on tonight's episode streaming on Zoom. And of particular note, the premiere of Nora Chapomery's latest work will be presented on August 27th. Um, In some very exciting news for our fellow bunheads, the American Ballet Theater will commemorate the 20th anniversary of the classic dance film Center Stage this fall with a virtual reunion of the stars from the film, including Zoe Saldana, Amanda Schull, Sasha Radetzky, and Ethan Stiefel, with all proceeds from the event supporting ABT's Crisis Relief Fund. After a video of 11-year-old Anthony Mesoma Madu dancing in the rain went viral, American Ballet Theater awarded the young Nigerian dancer a scholarship and internet access to participate in its virtual summer intensive. He'll also be headed to the U.S. to train in person next year thanks to a scholarship from Ballet Beyond Borders. So we're still mired in this COVID muddle, but it's not all bad news out there. Um, In our next segment, we'd like to discuss a video that made all of us forget for a minute there's even a pandemic happening, which we are endlessly thankful for. Um, That would be the video for Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion's WAP, an internet-melting anthem of female sexual empowerment. And in case you don't know what WAP stands for, hi mom, talking to you, it's an acronym for a well-lubricated vagina. And the video sparked 
passionate reactions of all kinds, many of them ridiculous, some of them insidious. Um, but we want to start out at least by talking about the dancing specifically, because this is a song that's all about the female body and the choreography put women's bodies on display in ways that deserve celebration and also further discussion. So if you haven't had a chance to watch this absolutely visually dazzling music video, which is, by the way, studied with cameos from pretty much all the iconic performers and celebrities you could imagine, it's choreographed by the absolutely fabulous and ever iconic Jaquel Knight, who has choreographed countless iconic music videos, but most famously the single ladies music, music video for Beyonce. And I just aside, bless... Cardi and Megan for crediting their choreographers. I, I mean, Jaquel and also assistant choreographers Doreen Littleton and Ashley Selden. They're right there in the YouTube credits. Hooray. You took the words out of my mouth. Retweet. I mean, the video is all about the dancing. We see so many clips of them, of both Cardi B, Megan Thee Stallion, dancing with their backup crew. It's stunning. There was a bit of behind the scenes footage of oh. Normani's section that Cardi actually took while doing a little voiceover <laughs> singing or attempting to sing Normani's hit motivation um, that also broke the internet as as the actual music video was breaking the internet. This clip was, was also doing its own internet breaking. I'm just going to say for my fellow Dancing with the Stars fans out there, it is not news that Normani can dance. She was amazing on that show, and it's even more amazing to get to see her to do some stuff outside of the ballroom universe. Um, there are also a whole lot of other familiar faces in this video in terms of the dance crew. Um, Dominique Cloud is in there, who also dances with Lizzo. Yorelis Apolinario, who we all love. You might know her from So You Think You Can Dance, among many other things. Um, but we also want to talk a little bit about some of the backlash to the video that's happening, just because there are a lot of just gross double standards at play here. Um, and ones that are applied with infuriating frequency to black women in particular, including black women dancers. Yeah. Um, would recommend everyone go read, uh, Brittany McNamara for Teen Vogue did a great op-ed really breaking down what these double standards are and how the reaction to this video is highlighting that disparity. Um, essentially, the argument is, you know, this goes back to a long history of policing women's sexuality uh, because women owning their own sexuality is oftentimes seen as a threat by cisgender men. It really does speak to broader issues about women maintaining bodily autonomy and sexual empowerment. And there are just so many issues at play here um, that go far beyond just dancing. But I think that are particularly important for dancers to think about because so much of what our work is is about being embodied and empowered within our own bodies. I think it's also super important to note that women of color and in particular black women are more often criticized for owning their sexuality. I mean, the belief that black women are hypersexual dates back to slavery era, like ideas around black culture. And I think the reaction to this video is particularly problematic in that light. Yeah, absolutely. I think ultimately this video and its choreography are things that made Cardi and Megan feel empowered, that allowed them to express full control over their own bodies. And it's, you know, it's sort of funny because to me, at least as someone who I watched the video after having heard or gotten wind of some of the criticism, it's WAP, it doesn't even seem all that boundary pushing mm -hmm. in terms of the types of imagery that's happening. I mean, there's a lot of sort of like camp hypersexualization. Mm -hmm. But mostly it just feels like a really great example of this already very well-established rap video genre. Well, and it's also sort of in a lot of ways, arguably, working within the male gaze to subvert uh, the male gaze. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, please go watch it if you have not seen please. it already, although odds are good that you probably have. <laughs> we'll link to it in the episode description just in case. Um, in our next segment, we're staying out here in the pop culture world to talk about, of course, TikTok. Um, because it does feel like we've had at least one TikTok-related segment per episode as of late. And that's an indication of just how central the app is becoming to the dance community. This week, we wanted to discuss an article that came out in Wired just as we were recording our last episode last week called TikTok and the Evolution of Digital Blackface. And it is a deep dive into the issue of cultural appropriation on the app. And it does a really excellent job synthesizing and distilling in a kind of bigger picture way a lot of the problems that we've talked about, at least through the lens of dance TikTok, and especially the tendency of, of white users to steal Black creators' choreography. Mm -hmm. 
So the article talks a lot about the different types of cultural appropriation that we see on TikTok, be it appropriation of AAVE, African American Vernacular English, appropriation of traditionally Black style, uh, appropriation of Black dance, be it the choreography being taken from Black TikTok creators, and just in particular choreography in historically Black dance forms. Um, and it talks about the fact that while cultural appropriation is an issue across pretty much all social media platforms, it appears that TikTok may actively be silencing Black voices and, you know, making the app more intentionally conducive to this cultural appropriation by removing audio from Black creators' videos talking about their experience on the app. One of the things that was discussed in this article is that uh, TikTok did release a letter a couple of weeks after Blackout Day. And, you know, the company appeared to be owning up to its uneven treatment of the Black creators on the app, but at the same time, uh, didn't actually address any of the specific concerns of those Black creators who are oftentimes the ones driving the primary traffic on the app. Uh, so being muted for non-offensive speech getting harassed by perpetrators who face, you know, no consequences. And again, the very existence of digital blackface. Yeah, I mean, I think while this whole idea that adopting black affects and rhythms is you know, a route to viral success, that TikTok is a particularly egregious example of that trend in action. I do think it's also that kind of problem is happening in the context of dance more broadly. I mean, the exploitation of the ingenuity of black creators by privileged users who like try on Black culture, that's a problem that extends deep into the dance community, especially in the worlds of commercial and competition dance. And if you're on TikTok, please make sure to credit your TikTok creators. And particularly if you're a TikTok user with a big following, consider duetting with the creators. It's a really great way to highlight the creator and their talent beyond just a tag in the caption, which people might not read. But really make sure to do your research and credit the appropriate creators for any dances you're doing, any audio you're using. So important. So now in our next segment, we're going to change gears or, I mean, really change cars entirely. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to talk about Point Shoe history. So this week, Point Magazine published an article tracing the development of the Point Shoe. And even if you think you already know the basics of the subject, because I did, there's still a ton of fascinating detail in there to discuss. And there's a little bit of controversy to unpack as well. Yeah, so my inner ballet history nerd got a great <laughs> kick out of this one. Uh, inner ballet history nerd. I'm a professional dance editor. It's what pretty I'm outer, saying. Courtney. <laughs> <laughs> It's kind of my whole public persona. Um, but it, you know, it takes us back through, um, uh, Marie Ancoupie de Camargo, who took the heels off of her shoe so that she could, uh, do more virtuosic steps up to, of course, Marie Taglioni, uh, darning the tips of her shoes to rise up on point. In between, there was that fun flying machine apparatus, which I think we all forgot was a thing. Completely left my memory. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, and it, it traces the evolution of the shoe and, you know, the invention of the hardened toe block, which uh, was used to such great effect by Marius Petipa in The Sleeping Beauty uh, and that entire Russian classical era, um, kind of just bringing us to today. That said, there was a bit of controversy around the article in that in acknowledging that point shoe manufacturers are slowly beginning to offer more diverse shades of point shoes for dancers of color, uh, did not acknowledge that was a look debuted by Dance Theater of Harlem in the 1970s. Yeah, and for years, their dancers were dyeing their tights, dyeing their point shoes, dyeing their ribbons in shades of brown to match their skin tones. And that's something that continues today with most black and brown dancers reading this article, I was thinking about how kind of baffling it is that point shoe companies were so willing to funnel money into research on shock absorption and musculoskeletal data collection and all these advanced technologies, but not into making widely sold inclusive point shoe shades. Like I obviously am in support of protecting dancers and making sure that point shoes are as healthy as they can be. But it's just disappointing that it took mass protests surrounding the murder of black people for so many mainstream point shoe companies to start selling inclusive shades. I. It is worth noting, uh, Capizio did offer uh, more diverse shades for a period of time in the 1980s, uh, and reportedly the breadth of uh, shades that were needed and compared to the demand led them to discontinue that. 
Um, and I believe Gaynor Minden, when they were first starting out, wanted to do that from the get go. Yeah, Eliza Gaynor Minden told Dance Spirit in a story that they did about inclusive shades and dancewear a little while back that, yeah, from the inception of the company, she had hoped to do more inclusive shades, but it was cost prohibitive. Um, but it's true. Yeah, it was always financial reasons were always sort of the excuse given. And it's like, well, yeah, that's complicated. But ethics, I don't know. <laughs> eth- yeah, ethics are also important. Honestly, if we want to diversify ballet, we need to diversify it on all sides. And that means representation matters. And that means investments will be necessary. Um, Okay. So speaking of inclusion in the ballet community, now we have the next installment in our voice memo series. Um, Each week, we've been asking a dancer or a dance leader to leave a message for the dance community, just talking about what they're working on, what they're thinking about, what's inspiring them right now in their own words. Um, So this week we have a message from the one and only Teresa Ruth Howard. She is a former member of Dance Theatre of Harlem and the founder of the digital platform Memoirs of Blacks and Ballet. And she has become a hugely important voice in the conversation about diversity and equity in the ballet world. If you have not yet read the excellent profile of her that just ran in the New York Times, please do so. We'll link that in the episode description too. So Teresa is about to host Memoirs of Blacks and Ballet's first ever virtual symposium, which you'll hear more about in her memo. Here she is. Hello, Dance Edit listeners. I'm Teresa Ruth Howard, the founder and curator for Ma Ballet, Memoirs of Blacks and Ballet. We're an organization that preserves, presents, and promotes the contributions of Black ballet dancers internationally. Our primary goal is to develop a comprehensive working community and network for Blacks in ballet at all stages and areas of the field. We act as a conduit between students, professional dancers, educators, choreographers, and artistic directors. As an advocate, a consultant, and a diversity strategist, I feel like it's my job to look at the issue of the lack of diversity 360 and develop mechanisms that correct or alleviate some of the obstacles or barriers to inclusion while educating ballet leadership, organizational boards, as well as schools about the implicit bias inherent in ballet both on stage and behind the curtain. And to shine a light on some of the blind spots that they might have to help them understand what it feels like to be a black body in a space traditionally created for and that caters to whiteness. Inclusion is a feeling. So that's why I created the first Ma Ballet Symposium, Inspiration, Education, Perspiration. Now that was a three-day event that was hosted by Pennsylvania Ballet last October, which feels like a lifetime ago. Now it focused on personal and professional development, education, and mentorship for intermediate and pre-professional level Black ballet students. The goal was to begin to identify and track young talent while providing supplemental coaching, counseling, and preparation for professional job placement and job opportunities. We also had an educator's track for studio owners and teachers to help them fortify their schools and programs because they are the ones that feed the professional pipeline. And we were all able to see the beautiful diversity of ourselves reflected. It was healing. We really built a village. Let me share a little bit about our upcoming Ma Ballet Virtual Symposium, Education, Communication, Restoration. Originally, it was scheduled to be held in August Um, and hosted by Boston Ballet School. However, the arrival of COVID and the subsequent quarantine, we were forced to postpone the in-person convening. And then I started to rethink the programming and wonder what we could offer digitally. So it's not what we intended, but given the shift in the world, it feels like it's what we needed. And it's quite exciting to be able to incorporate people from around the world and make this a truly international symposium, both with our panelists and our participants. With COVID and the BLM uprising stemming from the murders of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd, and subsequently the ballet world being called out for its lack of support of its Black dancers, I knew that we needed healing. We needed the village. So we took the village virtual. Now, unlike the symposium in October, which was specifically for black students, the virtual village will be open to all, but will center blackness. So what does that mean to center blackness? So the truth is we live in a world that has whiteness as a default for everything. Whiteness is centered. Everything 
is framed from, speaks to, um, mm-hmm. and is from a perspective of whiteness. And everybody else is forced to get in where they fit in. But in watching Toni Morrison's documentary, The Pieces That I Am, she speaks about her clear intention as a writer to speak or write from a space of blackness to blackness. When she observed that black writers before her, even James Baldwin, directed their writings to the white consciousness, I mean, they needed to in order to be granted space and entree, um, to help white writers, they decoded cultural aspects within their stories. Morrison decided that she would write directly to us as a people, right? For us as a people. And if white people didn't understand, then they would have to learn how to decode blackness, just like non-white people have to decode whiteness. So for the Ma Ballet Virtual Symposium, this will be a space for everyone where everyone is welcome and can contribute, but it's understood that blackness, the experience, and the voices are the focus. Now, this will be a very different experience for some of our non-black, specifically white friends and colleagues, but it is a crucial part of allyship, learning to yield the space. Like, it's not about you right now. It's paramount to changing the culture of ballet and ultimately to changing the world. Look, you guys, I know we've been in the house on our devices, zooma, zooma, zooming. We're all screen weary. So I created a petite amuse bouche, if you will, of programming. We're going from on Friday from about 3 to 6 and Saturdays from 12 to 2.30, 3 o'clock. Easy breezy. You can still have your weekend and still learn a little bit. Um, so we kick off Friday the 14th with our FUBU Town Hall, Centering Blackness, of course. And then we have ballet leadership in a conversation talking about um, how they're dealing with the outpouring of, of emotion from the black community and their DE&I uh, initiatives. But we have everything from you know, dance mentoring circles, a uh, guide to company life, social justice, how to activate your activism. We've got two ballet history um, sessions, Blacks and Ballet, um, part one, and then one on colorism, which is going to be a little bit scary uh, of a topic because it's just, it's it's deep and it's, um, it's very, very loaded. But in all things courage, we will persevere. Um, so check mobballet.org for a full list of programming, and you can register there as well. Um, finally, and I'm announcing it here, on the 29th, the coda, if you will, of the symposium will have me in conversation with choreographer William Forsyth talking about centering otherness in ballet. I'm so excited. And then we have a number of his dancers from Ballet Frankfurt in that 80s and 90s period when they were hot, 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 talking about their experience in response to our conversation. So I really hope you'll join us. Check us out. And I hope to be digitally, virtually seeing you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Teresa. I think there are a few people who are so clearly thoughtful in all of the work and programming that they do. Yeah, and thanks so much for sharing your voice with us at Dance Media over the years. I know mm-hmm. everything that I know and referenced about Dance Theater of Harlem's role in diversifying Point Two Shades, I learned from Teresa. She's been an incredible resource to all of us at Dance Media. Please visit, as she mentioned in her memo, mobballet.org to find out more about the symposium. There are so many great events on offer through that. Again, we'll include those links in the episode description to make sure that you can check them out. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this week. We'll be back next week for more discussion of the news that's moving the dance world. And in the meantime, keep learning, keep advocating, and keep dancing. Mind how you go, friends. Bye, everyone. The Dance Edit Podcast is a product of Dance Media, publisher of Dance Magazine, Dance Spirit, Point, Dance Teacher, Dance Business Weekly, and the Dance Edit Newsletter. Our hosts are Courtney Escoyne, Margaret Fuhrer, Lydia Murray, and Cadence Neenan. Our music is by Celestine, with special thanks to Broadway Dance Center for helping us record those football sounds. Find out more about The Dance Edit and subscribe to our daily newsletter at thedanceedit.com. Thank you.